Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 9 Assistance Given the Holy Souls If God consoles the souls with so much goodness, His mercy shines forth still more clearly in the power which He gives to His Church to shorten the duration of their sufferings. Desiring to execute this clemency, the severe sentence of His justice, He accords abatement and mitigation of pain but he does so in an indirect manner through the intervention of the living. To us he gives all power to succor our afflicted brethren by way of suffrage, by means of impetration and satisfaction. The word suffrage in ecclesiastical language is a synonym for prayer. Yet, when the Council of Trent declares that the souls in purgatory are assisted by the suffrages of the faithful, the sense of the word is more comprehensive. It includes, in general, all that we can offer to God on behalf of the departed. Now, we can thus offer to God not only our prayers, but all our good works, insofar as they are impreteratory or satisfactory. To understand these terms, let us recall to mind that each of our good works, performed in the state of grace, ordinarily possesses a triple value in the sight of God. First, the work is meritorious, that is to say, it increases our merit, it gives us right to a new degree of glory in heaven. Second, it is imprecatory, that is to say, like a prayer, it has the value of obtaining some grace from God. Third, it is satisfactory, that is to say, that as having, as it were, a pecuniary value. It can satisfy divine justice and pay our debts of temporal punishment before God. The merit is inalienable and remains the property of the person who performs the action. On the contrary, the imperpetratory and satisfactory value can benefit others in virtue of the communion of saints. This understood, let us put this practical question. What are the suffrages by which, according to the doctrine of the Church, we may aid the souls in purgatory? To this question we answer, they consist of prayers, alms, fasting, and penances of any kind, indulgences, and above all the holy sacrifice of the Mass. All the works performed in the state of grace, Jesus Christ allows us to offer to the Divine Majesty, for the relief of our brethren in purgatory, and God applies them to the souls according to his justice and mercy. By this admirable arrangement, while protecting the rights of his justice, our Heavenly Father multiplies the effects of his mercy, which is thus exercised at the same time in favor for the church suffering and the church militant. The merciful assistance which he allows us to give to our suffering brethren is of excellent profit to ourselves. It is a work not only advantageous to the departed, but also holy and solitary for the living. We read in the revelations of St. Gertrude that a humble religious of her community, having crowned an exemplary life with a very pious death, God designed to show the saint the state of the deceased in the other life. Gertrude saw her soul adorned with ineffable beauty, and dear to Jesus, who regarded her with love. Nevertheless, on account of some slight negligence not yet atoned for, she could not enter heaven, but was obliged to descend into the dismal abode of suffering. Scarcely she had disappeared into its depths, when the saint saw her come forth and rise towards heaven, transported thither by the suffrages of the church. Even in the old law, prayers and sacrifices were ordered for the dead. Holy Scripture relates as praiseworthy the pious action of Judas Maccabeus. After his victory over Gorgias, general of King Antiochus, the soldiers had committed a fault by taking from among the spoils some objects offered to the idols, which by law they were forbidden to do so. Then Judas, chief of the army of Israel, ordered prayers and sacrifices for the remission of their sin and for the repose of their souls. 
Let us see how this fact is related in Scripture. After the Sabbath, Judas went with his company to take away the bodies of them that were slain, to bury them with their kinsmen in the sepulchres of their fathers. And they found under the coats of the slain some of the donaries of the idols of Germania, which the law forbiddeth to the Jews, so that all plainly saw that for this cause they were slain. Then they all blessed the just judgment of the Lord, who had discovered the things that were hidden. And so betaking themselves to prayer, they besought him that the sin which had been committed might be forgotten. But the most valiant Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves from sin, for so much as they saw before their eyes what had happened because of the sin of those that were slain. In making a gathering, he sent 12,000 darachims of silver to Jerusalem for sacrifice he offered for the sins of the dead, thinking well and religiously concerning the resurrection. For if he had not hoped that they that were slain should rise again, it would have seemed superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. And because he considered they who had fallen asleep with godliness had great grace laid up for them. It is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from sins. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 10 Assistance given to the Holy Souls Holy Mass St. Augustine and St. Monica. In the new law we have the holy sacrifice of the Mass, of which the diverse sacrifices of the Mosaic law but are feeble figures. The Son of God instituted it, not only as a worthy homage given by the creature to the divine majesty, but also as a propitiation for the living and the dead, that is to say, as an efficacious means of appeasing the divine justice of God, provoked by our sins. The holy sacrifice of the Mass was celebrated for the departed, even from the time of the foundation of the Church. We celebrate the anniversary of the triumph of the martyrs, writes Tertullian in the 3rd century, and according to the tradition of our fathers, we offer the holy sacrifice for the departed on the anniversary of their death. It cannot be doubted, writes St. Augustine, that the prayers of the church, the holy sacrifice, the alms distributed for the departed, relieve the holy souls, and move God to treat them with more clemency than their sins deserve. It is the universal practice of the church, a practice which she observes as having received it from her forefathers, that is to say, the holy apostles. St. Monica, the worthy mother of St. Augustine, when about to expire, asked but one thing of her son, that he would remember her at the altar of God. And the holy doctor, when relating that touching circumstance in the book of his confessions, entreats all of his readers to unite with him in recommending her to God during the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Wishing to return to Africa, St. Monica went with St. Augustine to Ostia in order to embark, but she felt sick and soon felt that her end was approaching. It is here, she said to her son, that you will give burial to your mother. The one thing I ask of you is that you will be mindful of me at the altar of our Lord. St. Augustine continues, May I be pardoned for the tears that I shed, for that death should not be mourned which was but an entrance into true life. Yet consider with the eyes of faith the miseries of our fallen nature. I might shed before you, O Lord, other tears than those of the flesh. Tears which flow at the thought of the peril to which every soul is exposed that has sinned in Adam. It is certain that my mother lived in such a manner as to give glory to your name, by the activity of her faith and the purity of her morals. Yet dare I affirm that no word contrary to thy law ever escaped her lips? Alas, 
What will become of the holiest life if thou dost examine it in all the rigors of thy holy justice? For this reason, O God of my heart, I leave aside the good works which my mother has performed to ask of thee only the pardon of her sins. Hear me by the wounds of him who has died for us upon the cross, and who now seated at the right hand is our mediator. I know that my mother always showed mercy, that she pardoned from her heart all offenses, and forgave all the debts owing to her, canceled them her debts. If during the course of her long life there are many owing to thee, pardon her, O Lord, pardon her, and enter not into the judgment against her, for thy words are true. Thou hast promised mercy to the merciful. This mercy I believe thou hast already shown to her, O my God, but accept the homage of my prayer. Remember that her passage to the other life, thy servant desired for her body neither pomptuous funeral nor precious perfumes. She asked not a magnificent tomb, nor that she should be carried to that which she had caused to be constructed at Tazgate, her native place, but only that we should remember her at thy altar, whose mysteries are prized. Thou knowest, Lord, all the days of her life she took part in those divine mysteries which contain the Holy Viaticum, whose blood has effaced the sentence of our condemnation. Let her repose then in peace with my father, her husband, with the spouse to whom she was faithful during all the days of her union, and in the sorrows of her widowhood with him whose humble servant she made herself, to win him for thee by her meekness and patience. And thou, O my God, inspire thy servants, who are my brethren. Inspire all those who read these lines to remember at thy altar Monica, thy servant, and Petrius, who was her spouse, that all who still live in this false light of this world may piously remember my parents that the last prayer of my dying mother may be heard beyond her expectations. This beautiful passage of St. Augustine shows us the opinion of the great doctor on the subject of suffrages for the departed, and it makes us see clearly that the greatest of all suffrages is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 11 Assistance Rendered to the Souls Holy Mass The Jubilee of Leo the Thirteenth. We have witnessed the holy enthusiasm with which the Church celebrated the sacred audio jubilee of her venerated head, Pope Leo the Thirteenth. The faithful from all parts of the world went to Rome, either in person or in the heart, to offer their homage and gifts at the feet of the Vicar of Jesus Christ, the entire church militant rejoiced in the midst of her long trials. The church triumphant in heaven shared in this rejoicing by the canonization and beatification of a large number of her glorious members. Was it not fitting that the church suffering should also participate therein? Could our dear brethren in purgatory be forgotten? Should not those souls so dear to the heart of Jesus also experience the happy effects of that glorious feast? Leo XIII understood this, always guided by the Holy Spirit, when acting as supreme pastor, the Pope, by an encyclical letter dated April 1, 1888, decreed that throughout the entire Christian world there should be a solemn commemoration of the dead on the last Sunday of the month of September calling to mind with what admirable love the church militant had manifested her joy and how the church triumphant rejoiced with her to crown in a certain sense, says our Holy Father, this general exaltation, we desire to fulfill as perfectly as possible the duty of our apostolic charity by extending the fullness of infinite spiritual treasures to those beloved sons of the church who, having died the death of the just, have quitted this life of combat with the signs of faith, and having become offshoots of the mystical vine, 
although they are not permitted to enter into eternal peace, until they have paid the last farthing of the debt which they owe to the avenging justice of God. We are moved hitherto both by the pious desires of Catholics, to whom we know our resolution will be particularly dear, and by the agonizing intensity of the pain suffered by the departed souls. But we are especially inspired by the custom of the Church, who in the midst of the most joyful solemnities of the year forgets not the holy and salutary commemoration of the dead, that they may be loosed from their sins. For this reason, since it is certain from Catholic doctrine that the souls detained in purgatory are relieved by the suffrages of the faithful, and especially by the august sacrifice of the altar, we think we can give no more useful nor more desirable pledge of our love than by everywhere multiplying, for the mitigation of their pains, the pure oblation of the holy sacrifice of our divine mediator. We therefore appoint, with all necessary dispensations and derogations, the last Sunday of the month of September, next as a day of ample expiation, on which day there shall be celebrated by us, and likewise by our brethren, the patriarchs, archbishops, bishops, and by all the prelates exercising jurisdiction in a diocese, each in his own patriarchal church, metropolitan or cathedral, a special mass for the dead, with all possible solemnity, and according to the rite indicated by the missal of the commemoration of all the faithful departed. We approve that the same be done in the patriarchal and collegiate churches, secular as well as regular, provided the office proper for the mass of the day everywhere where such obligation exists be not omitted. As regards to the faithful, we earnestly exhort them, after having received the sacrament of penance, to devoutly nourish themselves with the bread of angels by a way of suffrage for the souls in purgatory. By our apostolic authority, to those of the faithful who do so, we grant a plenary indulgence to be applied to the souls departed in the favor of the privileged altar to all those who, as we have said above, shall celebrate Mass. Thus the holy souls who expiate the remains of their faults by those sharp pains will receive special and efficacious relief, thanks to the saving hosts which the universal church united to her visible head and animated with the same spirit of charity will offer to God, that he may admit them into the abode of consolation, of light, and eternal peace. Meanwhile, venerable brethren, we grant you affectionately in our Lord, as a pledge of these heavenly gifts, the apostolic benediction to you, and all the clergy, and to all the people confided to your care. Given at Rome under the seal of the fishermen, on the solemnity of Easter, in the year 1888, the eleventh of our pontificate.